Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. So much of history has been buried. Colonialism takes quite a bit of the blame, as does nature itself, which has swallowed the remains of entire civilizations over the years. That's why archaeologists travel all over the world, trying to fill in the missing pages of the historical record, one dig site at a time. In 2004, a new dig site was unearthed, and in the most unusual of places, Mary and Gary's backyard. Gary lived in Buckhaven, a small town in Fife on the eastern coast of Scotland. Residing along the North Sea, just across from Norway and the Netherlands, it wasn't completely out of the question for Vikings to have landed along Scottish shores hundreds of years earlier. In fact, from the 8th to the 15th centuries, Vikings and Norwegians did colonize parts of Scotland. This period of time is known as Scandinavian Scotland, and there is evidence of their presence still around today. For example, on the island known as the Bruff of Bursay, there are archaeological remains of an entire Norse village. But unfortunately, we know very little about this period. Written records were stolen or destroyed, and the records that do exist tend to be biased depending on which culture wrote them, English or Irish. Carved runes are still present, though, having been etched into large stones and rocks that have lasted to this day. What remains, though, is often found in remote areas of Scotland or on uninhabited islands, areas easily preserved due to lack of population and construction activity. Nobody, including Mary and Gary, would have imagined finding a settlement right in her backyard. Her home had been built in the 1930s, and surely someone would have found something when the foundation was poured. But while she was digging in her garden in the summer of 2004, Gary uncovered smooth stones beneath the soil. Stones she hadn't put there in the first place. She'd recently watched a television program about valuable artifacts discovered in public places and believed these stones were evidence that she had also found something valuable herself. So she reached out to her local town council for their advice, and they contacted chief archaeologist Douglas Spears. Spears came to the house and examined the stones. He believed Gary was, in fact, sitting on a major historical discovery. He called in his team, who immediately trucked in specialized equipment as they took over her backyard and established the dig site. As they worked, they uncovered more stones, as well as a few odd artifacts. The team didn't think too much of them, though, considering this was someone's functioning backyard. A digging tool or gardening glove would be an expected thing to find in such a location. However, Spears and his team didn't find a digging tool or a glove. What they found instead was much stranger than that. One item was a child's gas mask from World War II. They also found an old television remote control, yet there had been no TV out there at the time. Still, they kept digging, hoping to find Viking tools or the foundation of some ancient villager's home, something to justify the months they'd spent tearing up this poor woman's backyard. And by January, they'd done it. After months of toiling at Mary and Gary's house in Buckhaven, Spears had in fact made a discovery. All the telltale signs were there. The antiquated construction techniques, the depth at which the stones had been found, as well as the sheer size of the area. Mary and Gary's garden had been sitting on top of a patio. A sunken patio, to be exact. One that had been laid down in the 1940s. Spears and the other archaeologists had been so obsessed with the possibility of uncovering an ancient Viking settlement that they ignored all the evidence that what they'd spent months unearthing had been nothing more than a place to enjoy a cold glass of lemonade. Spears felt like a fool for wasting all that time, but Marion, thankfully, wasn't too upset by all of it. After all, she now had a new backyard restoration project with which to occupy herself, all because she had left no stone unturned. It's difficult to believe in things we cannot see. And sure, there are exceptions, like gravity or the wind, but we can anchor our belief in them on the way that they affect the world around us. Other things, though, are a lot more difficult to believe in. Unless, of course, we manage to capture them on film. 
Elsie and Frances were cousins. Frances and her mother had come to Cottingley, a small village in northern England, to live with Frances' aunt in 1917. Elsie was a bit older than her nine-year-old cousin, but the two often played together in a stream close to the property. When the girls returned to the house, they usually came back wet and with muddy feet. However, they also came back with a reason for their frequent trips to the water. They were playing with the fairies. Their mothers didn't believe them, of course, but Elsie was determined to show them the truth. With her father's camera in hand, the girls trudged back down to the stream. Half an hour later, they returned with that proof. Elsie gave her father back his camera, and he developed the photographic plate in his private darkroom. The photo depicted Francis, half hidden behind a bush, as four fairies hovered in the foreground. Elsie's father thought it was a joke. Another photo was taken a few months later, and this time Elsie was in front of the camera and she had her hand extended to a gnome no more than a foot tall. Her father still wrote the photograph off as a prank, but her mother Polly believed them to be true. Fairies, you see, were a hot topic back then, as was the field of occultism. Polly attended a meeting in 1919 of the Theosophical Society, which believed in a secretive group of spiritual masters who were more evolved than everyone else. These masters were smarter, lived longer, and could even read minds. The meeting that Polly attended was about fairy life, and after it was over, she showed her daughter's photos to the speaker. From there, they quickly went public. They were viewed as proof of the girls' higher evolution, since they had manifested the fairies to such a degree that they could be photographed by a common camera. One of the leaders of the Theosophical Society, Edward Gardner, sent both the photos and the original photographic plates to an expert who concluded that they were indeed authentic. The fairies were not paper cutouts as Elsie's father had originally assumed. Gardner continued to use the photographs in his talks and sold prints of them in his lectures. Eventually, they were noticed by another theosophist, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the celebrated author behind the most famous detective in the world, Sherlock Holmes. Doyle was working on a piece about fairies for The Strand magazine when he learned of the photographs. He wrote to Elsie and her father and offered to pay for use of them in his article. Her father was only too happy to oblige, but refused to accept payment. He believed the photos should remain pure, for the benefit of the public, of course. The photos were subjected to more scrutiny, this time under the expert eye of the Kodak company, who determined that they had not been doctored. However, there was no way to determine whether the fairies posing with Francis were real. Other experts attempted to debunk the photos as fake, but Gardner shrugged them off as biased opinions by non-believers. In 1920, Gardner went to visit the Wright family in Cottingley for definitive proof using his own cameras. He left the cameras, as well as two dozen glass plates, with Elsie and Francis. In order for the fairies to come out for their pictures, though, the girls had to be alone. So Elsie's mother went to her sister's house for tea, while Elsie and Francis took more photographs in the garden. One picture depicted a fairy practically leaping toward Francis's nose, while another had a fairy presenting Elsie with a flower. The glass plates from the camera were then packed up and sent back to Mr. Gardner who wrote to Doyle with some good news. Those new photos were eventually published as part of Doyle's article, and the public was unsure of how to take them. Some believed them to be real, but most laughed, claiming the girls had pulled a fast one on Doyle and Gardner. Still, there was something to be said for the innocence of two children who had not lost their sense of wonder as they'd grown older. It didn't take long for the hype surrounding the Cottingley fairies to die down. For many years, Francis and Elsie fell out of the public eye. And then, in 1966, the Daily Express newspaper in England interviewed Elsie about the photos. She said it was possible that they'd been nothing but her imagination run amok, but there was also a chance that they were real. Twenty years later, the girls came clean. In an article for the Paranormal magazine, The Unexplained, Elsie and Francis confessed that they actually had seen fairies down by the stream in Cottingley, but the photographs had been faked. The fairies had been nothing more than paper cutouts. After they took the photos, they tossed the evidence of their deception into the water. But there was one photo the women disagreed on. It was the fifth and final picture taken, titled Fairies and Their Sunbath, in which one fairy enjoys the morning sunshine while the other struggles to wake up from her peaceful slumber. Neither Elsie nor Francis are anywhere in the photo, only the two fairies. 
Elsie believed it to be a fake just like the others, but Frances maintained until her death in 1986 that the photograph had been real. Her belief was so strong that she instilled it in her daughter, who also went on television attesting to the authenticity of the photo that her mother had taken. For Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths, their fairy photos became a worldwide phenomenon, inspiring several books and films, turning their story into a real-life fairy tale. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.